We are meeting today in the framework of the Polish Chemical Congress in Warsaw. That's the biggest uh, Congress like this in Europe, according to the words of the President of the Polish Chamber of the Chemical Industry, who is the main organizer of the event. And today I have a pleasure to speak with Mr. Szymon Domagalski, the policy advisor of the Polish Chamber of the Chemical Industry. And we are meeting here just after the panel dedicated to the PFAS regulation. And it was very inspiring discussion presenting the different approaches and the vision of the chemical industry regarding PFAS. And we really would like to know what's the industrial approach to this regulation, taking into account the risks and the benefits associated to the uh, to the PFAS, to the use of PFAS in the products we use for daily basis? Hmm. As I said during the panel, there's no easy question and nor easy answer to the question regarding the PFAS. Uh, this is, of course, a big dilemma from the regulatory point of view, because in one hand, we have like a huge number of substances with incredibly valuable for the society and for achieving the sustainable development goals uh, properties like water resistant, oil resistance, very durability. So they are extremely useful in many applications like healthcare, uh, security, safety, uh, even defense uh, and electronics. So that, that the uses of this broad group of, uh, of substance are, are, are very um, broad. And um, what we are but from the other side, there is also um, risk related to health and environment, related to also to the same properties. And um, what we are need to do is to provide the right balance between that. Also, what is very important from um, the, the, in this discussion is that the fact that the PFAS can be transported for very long distances. So it could be found in the very remote areas, even far away from the um, uh, exposure uh, for, for the way, uh, for the place where it was uh, emitted to the environment, uh, which means that locally uh, uh, taken initiative to, to ban or restrict uh, PFAS are limited in their scope. So what we um, discussed today was also the idea of the European um, Commission. But this is not actually the idea of the European Commission. This is the uh, proposal of five European countries to introduce the um, ban for uh, all PFASs. So, and this approach, which was proposed in this restriction proposal, is actually even more ambitious than uh, the one which was envisaged in the chemical strategy for sustainability. When the Council gave the mandate to the Commission, to European Commission, uh, to eliminate all essential uses, uh, all, all uh, no, sorry, to eliminate um, PFAS which are not essential for um, society. And um, Today we have a chance also to um, go deeply into the, what the essential use means. And it was clearly uh, explained by the European Commission that there are two um, um, conditions which has to be met at um, the same time. First, it has to be um, critical. Uh, I, I don't have uh, the, the, the text in front of me, but it was uh, something like that there is a um, mm, they are necessary for uh, safety or health or uh, critical for the mm, society needs, something, something like that. And the other part was that they, has, they don't have uh, an alternatives. And what we also mentioned during the discussion is that it's not so easy to determine what actually the uh, it means that there is uh, available alternatives to the substance because if the substance have uh, many application, it means that in one application it can be um, easily um, replaceable. For example, because we don't need the same durability in the consumer product as we envisage in the 
um, industrial settings when we have like a, a huge complex industrial um, installation where in case of failure of, of failure of, of sailing or of, of, of pipe or whatever kind of materials we could have like a serious accident which could cause really harm for humans and the environment. It sounds that the industry really thinks and considers how to replace PFAS substances. But on the other hand, uh, is it always correct approach that these alternatives that can be proposed to the market, they can be better? Uh, who gonna assess this uh, how the, situa the situation, if the substance is better because it's not a PFAS, or the PFAS is even better and less harmful to the, uh, to the environment. Is there any specific uh, approach to that? Because what I understand, the, uh, we, when we are talking about the essential use of PFAS, it means that it cannot be replaced or the substance that can replace PFAS, it's not better mm -hmm. in many, many ways. Who's going to assess the situation? How to find the right balance that uh, the institution who will decide, yes, in this case, this alternative is better? Uh, and do we have any influence on this decision? Um. This is also a difficult question. This is what, what, you, what you refer to is uh, the um, aspect of regrettable substitution. This is um, the, the, the phrase which is often used in this regard. Um, the, according to my knowledge, the, the Risk Assessment Committee is the, the body, ECA uh, committee, which uh, uh, gives the advice in regard to the risks related to the substances. And <clears throat> during their um, assessment process, they also assess the available alternatives and related risk to these uh, alternatives. And they do it based also on the um, information they received from the uh, industry during the consultation process and also from the literature and uh, other uh, sources. Uh, today we also have a chance to talk with uh, uh, OECD representatives, um, which also in talk about the OECD works and uh, how the OECD helping to um, looking for the alternative also for a PFAS. And all of this brings me to the question, how this can influence the competitiveness of the European chemical industry? Uh, do you foresee uh, at the special risks uh, related to the to this restriction and how the industry can be influenced by that. Yes, of course. Of course, uh, now the mm, restriction proposal is the, in the screen, scrutiny of ECA, so we don't know how it will be finally um, final text of the of the restriction. However, based on the proposal, uh, the risks are um, very high because <coughs> we are not only going to um, ban the production of uh, PFAS, but we will ban all kind of uh, also use in the um, production of, uh, of articles, uh, which uh, pose, uh, and also in the placing on the market of these articles. So in one hand, it should provide the level playing field because all articles containing PFAS will be banned. However, having in mind that the enforcement of such an mm, ambitious um, approach will be very difficult uh, to, to, to provide, um, may put a uh, European industry in a very difficult position when they will not be able to produce PFAS, which are, as I mentioned at the beginning, very the, 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 the um, substances which provide very useful properties, but <clears throat> in the same times, uh, time, the consumer and uh, could buy the same um, products which contain PFAS from abroad uh, if they will not be, of course, identified on the uh, 
during, during the import. However, having in mind that the number of, of uh, imported articles, goods, and uh, also uh, e-commerce that consumers could buy individually things from the abroad, uh, make it impossible to identify all of those PFAS in, in the product. So it's definitely put our industry in a more difficult position. And taking all of this into account, how would you frame uh, like the main message to the ICA and to the European Commission regarding what might be expected, what type of regulation, what kind of approach uh, is expected from the industrial point of view? What would be the best uh, way for you to adapt to this changing environment, to the changing situation, to this, all these requirements? but also to keep the industry competitive uh, globally. How to uh, proceed with all of this in the best possible way that we can ensure that our industry stays uh, important and we can ensure it grows? Okay, uh, the industry is very committed to limited emission to the PFAS, that's, that's for sure. We hear also today during the discussion that there are certain uh, voluntary action already taken to limit uh, the um, emission of PFAS during the production and on the end of life cycle of the uh, um, fluor like polymers, uh, which is the specific group of, uh, of PFAS. Um, however, uh, we we could be advised by also the um, work of other OEC, OECD members uh, um, who also trying to, um, of course, reduce the emission because this is like considered as a uh, global uh, issue of global concern for that definitely. Uh, however, there are different approaches taken by different countries starting from monitoring, reporting, uh, limiting the emission in the, during the production, uh, the collection of, uh, of different uh, mm, waste and, and uh, uh, manage them in a sustainable way. So there are some uh, possibility to manage the, the PFAS, uh, at least in those most important applications, like for example, the spare parts. This is the idea which is very important for industry because you have like an installation and for example, you need to have like a sealant in, in it or, or pipe and from time to time, something broke, something has to be repaired or, uh, and, or, or even on a regular basis uh, just uh, to, to adapt to, to, to the new processes. And then you just need to replace one part and you don't have it because there are no produce anymore and you cannot buy it because it contains PFAS. So that, that's really uh, could, you know, turn off your whole installation because of lack of the spare parts. That's a real problem for, for the industry, I think. So uh, monitoring, that's definitely. Uh, looking for the emission to the environment uh, and to, um, to the water, that's, that's the main threat, I think. And uh, also, the, the restriction is good, good idea, and certain articles, like a ski wax, for example, that's, that's the, the article which definitely can be uh, taken off from the market because it's released to the environment and there's not much of the social benefit for it. However, there are many applications which are very essential, especially in an industrial context. So if I will have to advocate for something, I will uh, advocate for derogation for the spare parts and for the derogation of uh, industrial use of PFAS in the industrial applications, and maybe also in the F gases in the, closing, uh, in the closed systems, which would not uh, emit any uh, pollution outside. So um, I, I think that that might be the, 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 the message. Maybe just one more question, uh, because except, of course, these derogations and this essential use, do you see the need of any other European initiatives, the initiatives on the European level, like investing in uh, innovations or in new skills, new, sk new technologies that can support this transition from this use of PFAS, essential use of PFAS, 
to the full uh, ban on PFAS, maybe in the future when we finally uh, find something that can replace it. Okay, I'm, I'm not the chemist in, from, uh, in training, so I, it's really hard for me to assess how we could uh, looking for the alter alternatives. However, having in mind that this is one of the strongest bond in the, in the organic chemistry, it is really hard to, um, to replace it uh, in, in most of the uh, application which required extremely dura durability and extreme conditions like you know in for example in industrial settings when there you have a huge heat huge pressure and, and and so on so you don't you couldn't compromise on safetyness because it's just could cause the more damage to the environment when there will be a leakage and or uh, explosion or whatever a failure of the installation so uh, what to do to, to, to looking for the alternatives. Of course, the international uh, organization as uh, OECD can help us with that. This should be like uh, more coordinated action towards looking for the alternatives. Um, I personally think that the uh, artificial intelligence might be something which could help us in looking for in general terms for the alternatives for the uh, substance and of course the quantum, quantum computers the, the quantum computing uh, will give completely different and better uh, possibility to looking for a um, more complex uh, formulation and for more complex chemicals which and we will be able to uh, assess it uh, before we produce it uh, what, how they will uh, react and whether there will be uh, danger for health and environment. So that might be the, uh, uh, something which we are uh, looking into in the future. Thank you for this message. Generally, the Polish Chemical Congress is a very inspiring event, uh, taking into account many aspects of the chemical industry, looking uh, at the future of it, Unfortunately, we do not have uh, a very bright situation right now, looking at the numbers presented, uh, especially at the beginning by the uh, president of the Polish uh, Chamber of the Chemical Industry. Uh, how do you see the future of the chemical industry, of the European chemical industry, taking into account all these restrictions and this very ambitious approach to the to the industry, do you see a brighter future or uh, it's going to be extremely challenge? Hmm. <laughs> it is also the difficult question. You don't ask easy question. Uh, there, we are in a quite difficult situation in Europe because we don't have like easy access to cheap energy sources like big gas resources or um, or other uh, petrol uh, chemicals uh, like oil and 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 gas um, we don't also have a cheap labor we don't have we have like advanced regulation which um, very very well that we have it. They ask to invest in safetyness and, and security of the processes, which put us from the beginning in much more difficult situation than the competitors in, uh, in other regions when they don't have such a advanced leg legislation and they have an access to the cheap, uh, mm, cheap uh, energy and, and resources. So, it is really hard to compete in this. Uh, that's why we need to have like uh, some additional uh, market um, advantages for for, the, for our, our our market. And what I also envisage is that there is a growing market for sustainable chemistry, which means that we are looking for more green solutions with, with uh, for the mm, substances which are produced. Uh, with the uh, less um, environmental influence, and less carbon uh, footprint, uh, they are more environmentally friendly, and that's why we need an innovation to 
because that's our only weapon in, in Europe, that we have to be innovative, we have to think perspectively, but when we produce this substance and when you will have it in your hand, you will invest a lot of money to, to invent it, to start the production, you, and your competitive, uh, competitors will have similar substance, but few cents cheaper, then your consumer will choose the cheaper one. And that's why we also need the intervention from the, um, in, from the EU uh, side, that we should support those sustainable alternatives uh, and by the, I don't know, maybe some kind of donation and also the market. Um, so we need some kind of market protection on the European level to stay competitive globally. Exactly. We need the market protection and we need to encourage our uh, producer to look for more sustainable chemistry. Thank you very much for this message. Thank you for the invitation and opportunity to take part in the Polish Chemical Congress. And I wish you a very successful uh, discussions here and of course a lot of successes uh, in the future.